Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 20 of the Clarinet Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Dedaria Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Dedario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, Dedario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Dedario Woodwinds, visit Dedario.com woodwinds. Today's guest on the podcast is the legendary Harry Sparnai, who has had an unbelievable career as a pioneer of the bass clarinet. He has performed all around the world, recorded over 60 CDs, even written a book on the subject, and has had over 650 works composed for him by most of the heavyweight 20th century composers, including Feldman, Fernie Howe, Jung, Zanakis, and countless others. We discuss his deep love for the bass clarinet, which he fondly calls the emperor of the instruments, and you'll hear why in this episode, his advice for young students and performers, and even, of all things, the benefits of making music on a garden hose. Harry would also love to hear from the clarinet audience regarding his recordings over the years. As many of you know, he retired at age 70 a few years back and has been trying to listen to as many live recordings as possible, but it's really tough to get a hold of a lot of them. If you have or know of someone who might have some recordings of Harry throughout the years, please contact Harry directly through his website at harrysparnai.info. I'll include a link to this in the show notes. If you find that you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving a rating and review on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, consider purchasing your new and neat clarinet products from the Clarinet online store at clarinet.com store. If you have any thoughts, requests for upcoming guests or listener questions, you can contact directly at feedback at clarinet.com. The giveaway for today's episode is a Didario prize pack featuring one box of classic or reserve reeds, a reed guard, and a pack of mouthpiece patches. If you'd like to be eligible to win this and other exciting giveaways mentioned on the podcast, please subscribe with your email address for the email newsletter. In addition to a chance to win, you'll also receive content updates, exclusive coupons and offers, and more. See clarinet.com for details. Before we get started, I'd like to play a gorgeous example of Harry's playing, and something that really exemplifies his contribution to the development of the solo bass clarinet genre. This is Harry Sparnai performing Yi Sang Yoon's monologue for bass clarinet solo, recorded in 1984. So thank you so much for coming on the clarinet.com podcast, Harry. It's just great to talk with you today. Th- thanks for coming on the show. Yes, I like it also. <laughs> um, there's a great documentary that's been posted on YouTube about you that gives some really fantastic insight into your career as a performer and teacher. Everyone um, listening should actually watch this, and I'm going to post it in the show notes. What was the story behind that film, and, and what was its mission? Uh, the story is because uh, the composer, Roderick de Man, I think he is one of the the best composers uh, we have in Holland, and uh, he wrote uh, 10 pieces for me now. And he wanted to write a new piece for bass clarinet and electronics. Mm-hmm. And then the people from the, 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 the doc- documentary, they wanted to make a, uh, a documentary about me, and then they thought that it would be fantastic to make a documentary immediately with the first performance of that piece. So. Uh, and that was the idea. So then it was going on and on and on. And at the end of the, uh, the documentary, I played the piece Juxta Positionis by Roderick de Man. Mm-hmm. And um, that was the idea. And uh, uh, his, they came here uh, to Spain. I was teaching uh, still at that time at the SMOOC in Barcelona. And they came and they were filming and they were, when my, I was speaking with Roderick, when I was um, uh, working with my wife, we have a duo, etc., etc. 
So that's yeah, it went very well. And uh, always when <laughs> when I do things and I have to speak, it is going well because I I like to speak. <laughs> you like to speak to the public. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Uh, I always thought it is so stupid uh, when I go to a contemporary concert and then we are playing very 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 difficult music and mm -hmm. we must know we must be aware that we are doing that and we are studying that that those pieces hours and hours and hours but the audience is only listening for uh, 20 minutes or something so they get an immense lot of information so you have to introduce you have to say something to the audience and not like sometimes you see program notes, they are so intelligent that sometimes I read the program notes and I think, is that the piece I am playing? I don't understand what the composer is saying. And that is not, nothing for the audience. You have to, to keep them comfortable. You have to, we are doing something very, very, very difficult. I love it. I love it. I always loved it. How do you entice the audience into the new music? Yes, you know that for me, the music I always played is one of the, the most exciting things I had. Uh, this is always getting new pieces and always getting new problems. And uh, you know, a lot of people, they, when they get a problem, they, get, they, have a pro they have a problem. They said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do this. I cannot do this, blah, blah. For me, it was always, when I got a problem, I was always thinking, Hey, wait a moment, wait a moment, wait a moment. This is not possible, but let's see what we can do. And then the feeling after two months sometimes, it was possible. That feeling was fantastic. So after a while, when I played for the first time Fernie Howe, believe me, the first performance that was in the Royan Festival, I don't know anymore, 1976 or 1974, I don't know. Are we talking about the time and motion study? Time and motion study. And believe me, I came on stage to play the first performance and I thought, I saw the notes, eight music stands, and I saw the notes and I said, but I cannot play this, I cannot, I cannot play this, I cannot play this. And then I went and I played and I played like a madman. But after 20 performances, more or less, I caught the feeling, yes, 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 it is possible. Yes, yes, I can play it. So when you've accomplished a piece like that, what, what do you look back on the, the things that you thought were really difficult before? Does it feel like an accomplishment? Like you just climbed a big mountain or what does it feel like? Oh, yes, yes, that is. That, and for me, that has been always a feeling uh, to go on, to go on. And so, and so I never said immediately, this is impossible. I looked and I thought, mm, this is, mm, I think, impossible. I think impossible. And then, you know, nearly everything there is a possibility, especially the bass clarinet is an, such a fantastic instrument. And we have, uh, uh, in, for example, in the third register, we have so many possibilities with different fingerings. And to, so sometimes when there is a phrase impossible because of one note, uh, you say, oh, wow, when that F sharp should have been different then and then looking okay thinking f sharp is an overblowing note of the c sharp but also from the f sharp and thinking thing and then suddenly i caught another fingering so that's why you see in my book sometimes a high note with uh, 10 fingerings yeah oh absolutely and that is fantastic i love that oh yeah i love that <laughs> So in the documentary, actually, you mentioned that you really love when students ask to play more contemporary music. You feel yeah. almost as though you've made converts. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is it so inspiring to you about new music and, and sharing that with others? No, not, it is not only the, the new music. For me, new mu music is kind of uh, yeah, a, a picture of now, of today. Sometimes I listen to a new piece by a composer and I think, yeah, it's, it sounds good, but the man miss, is missing a lot of history, what is happening, what is happening. And for me, when we play contemporary music, of course, what I told you already, we have to be very careful because it is very difficult. And I don't want, and that's why I want to, to not yeah, push them, not press them, push them, please go on with contemporary music. The bass clarinet is a so-called new instrument. 
I mean new instrument, the first bass clarinet, don't laugh, but it is really true, is from 1740-50. Mm -hmm. But nobody wanted to play it and we had to wait uh, till Adolf Sachs and then the bass clarinet became more and more an instrument. But always an instrument in the orchestra and not before the orchestra. Yeah, it was never regarded as a solo instrument. No, and no, no, never. That actually takes me to my next question. Many would regard you as the person who raised the bass clarinet's status to that of a solo instrument. Um, you really kind of single-handedly brought it to this this place. Um, but many students actually still struggle with, with having the bass clarinet receive that status. And uh, what are your thoughts on that issue as far as it goes? Uh, yeah, this is really very difficult because... Uh, when I started, I started in a country, um, I'm living now in Spain, but uh, I'm from Holland, you know. Yeah. And in Holland, uh, the, we have had a, a, a period so fantastic, everything was possible, everything was possible. And when I started with the bass clarinet, and I went on and on and on, there was a director at the Conservatory of Amsterdam, who said, yes, but this is so fantastic. I want to have to include this in the, the whole, uh, how do you say that, uh, uh, year, the, the school. Semester. Yeah, the my master, and uh, I, yeah, fantastic. So I was, I think, the first who was teaching the bass clarinet. And then the, it was amazing. I had sometimes in alone at the conservatory more students than the three clarinet professors together. Wow. I had classes from uh, uh, the last years, I had 15 until 20 students. They came from America, all, all the way, all, from all the places they came. And then, and now we are going back to the contemporary music, what I think when you play the bass clarinet, and uh, it is really a new instrument, you can say it is a new instrument because the real instrument to play it fantastically is from 19. 50, 90, 60. Eh? So yes. the first instrument I caught was also quite, quite terrible, eh? quite terrible. So I had to speak a lot with the factory, but they wanted to do it. And now we have a perfect instrument. But when you want to play the instrument, the bass clarinet, I think, please, please don't play the sweetest from Bach. I love the sweetest from Bach, but it is for cello and not for bass clarinet. Bach didn't know the uh, bass clarinet. The bass clarinet did not exist. Just please don't play Bach. During Bach's time, though, wasn't he very open to trans uh, transcribing? Oh, yes. The Oh no, that, that is sure, that is for sure. sure you can do it, and always uh, my students when they come to me, they have to practice what I say, but not to play what I am playing. No, 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 no. When they want to play Bach, they play Bach. Oh, I see. But but when a student is coming to me, I only had it in my whole career only with one student, and the student only wants to play. Uh, transcriptions from Vivaldi, Bach, etc. Then I ha say, please, you have to find another uh, teacher because that is not the way I'm teaching bass clarinet. You can do Bach uh, the transcriptions and you can play uh, uh, the cello sonata from Debussy. You can do it, but you also have to play Xenakis because that is the bass clarinet from now. So and I see what you're saying. You're saying that um, you can't just play the old repertoire. You really have to get into the new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know who Catherine Ladano is? She's a bass clarinetist in Canada here. And we were chatting recently about this on another episode of the podcast. Um, because here there's only two universities, I think, in all of Canada that offer a bass clarinet degree. Um, yeah. What's the situation like over in, in Europe now? Um, it is changing, but not always in the best way, I must mm. say. Uh, Amsterdam is... Uh, more or less okay i'm not teaching there anymore and the professor there now is not doing a lot but it is a pity but in groningen in the north of holland there is now a young girl or young uh, former student of mine fee schouten see it doing a master in italy there are masters in england are masters but still uh, in austria uh, uh, austria yeah are master so it is coming but in Rotterdam, for example, there was my uh, former student, Henri Bock, and they stopped with the bass mm -hmm. So it is uh, fighting, still fighting and going on and going on. Uh, 
Uh, and now, with all the crisis there is in the whole world, uh, financially, it is uh, not easier. When you were a student trying to pursue this path, it must have been even more difficult back then. What was it like? No, I didn't feel it was difficult, no. no. Oh, no? Okay. Because, yeah, many people today, for example, who want to play bass as a solo instrument, I, I think they face some resistance to that. Oh, yes, but I had a lot of resistance. Oh, you mean that? But That's what I mean. Sorry, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to have resistance. So, no, no, no. So, that is not a problem for me. So, uh, when I... Listen, the, my beginning was a little bit different because when the, I was young, you, you know that, you read the book, uh, I played saxophone, the tenor, tenor saxophone. And when I wanted to be a musician, my father said, okay, you have to study uh, the conservatory because there are enough street musicians. I want that you study. Okay, and I go to the uh, conservatory. But at that time, the saxophone was completely forbidden. It was a dirty instrument. It was, yeah, I'm, we are speaking about 1960, eh? 1960. Yeah. Now, now the saxophone is accepted in all the places, but at not in my time. No, man, no, man, not at all. So I came there with my saxophone <laughs> and they looked at me very, very strange. And they said, but what, 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 what are you playing? And I said, um, I want to play, uh, uh, well, you needn't from Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. And they said, what? And I was playing as a tenor sax and I made an uh, improvisation, blah, blah, blah. And nobody, <laughs> nobody wanted to have me. Only one guy. And that was <laughs> the playing a professor. He said, yes, I want that, that guy. I want that. And he told, he spoke with me and he said, uh, yeah, but you have to speak, you have to uh, uh, play clarinet, but don't worry, that's also good for your saxophone technique. And I said, okay, no problem. I wanted to be a musician, so I started clarinet, but I always missed the sound of the, sax the, the tenor saxophone. So I was practicing more and more and more and more, and life changed. I started playing more clarinet, always more contemporary pieces than the classical pieces. I remember one time I was playing Weber and my professor looked at me and he said to me, you don't like it, eh? And I said, no, I don't like it at all, I'm sorry. And he said to me, yes, but you have to practice it. He said, okay, no problem. But you don't need to play it. Oh, say, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you really think, did, did your father's encouragement then to seek formal training how did that shape your career then? How is it different than it would have been? Oh, I think it would have been completely different because my idea was working, for example, in a, in a shop and in the evening playing in a jazz club or with friends, etc., etc. No, it should have been completely different. Completely different. But now I want to uh, uh, go on with uh, the, at the end of the study, I had already two uh, degrees for the normal clarinet. And then my professor came with a big case. And I thought, hey, a saxophone, what is this? And then he opened and there was a bass clarinet. And he was a fantastic professor. I loved him, Rui Otto, he was fantastic. And he said uh, to all the students who were, oh, you can blow a little bit. And everybody was blowing a little bit and everybody had a problem. And believe me or not, you can ask him. He is still alive. He is 93. Wow. I played three, four notes. I looked at him and I said, yes, but this is the instrument I want to play. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, Harry, please don't do this. Don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't do this. You cannot earn your money. Please don't. Yes, I want to play this instrument. I'm sorry. So I finished my uh, last degree for normal playing that. I closed my cases. And then uh, I had to sell my uh, tenor saxophone to buy a bass playing that. And then uh, I started. It was 1967 or 66. Yeah. But you, were so, you were so sure. Nothing. <laughs> so you were so sure about the, the bass clarinet that you sold your beloved tenor sax, though. Yeah, that was, yeah, that, yeah. But, but I have him back. Eh? I have him back now. <laughs> oh, you have one again? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So what is it about the deep, rich tone that really draws you to those instruments? Like you say that even when you were playing clarinet, like you kind of missed that part about the tenor sax and then bass clarinet was just the best of both worlds. So oh, what is it? Yeah, it is not only the lower, lower note, eh? it is the, some of, uh, the, the possibilities from all the registers. Listen to the bass clarinet. Mm -hmm. We can do, for example, I don't know 
um, uh, if you know the clarinet solitude by Yoyo Yuasa, is a Japanese composer. It is a beautiful piece, but it is for clarinet, original for clarinet, and it is going up to the high E flat. There's above the high C, yes? Yes. So the so four, four I legend lines. Many, I don't know how many lines, but uh, a lot, yeah? Are we talking the, the C uh, above super, sorry, the E flat above super C? Yeah, the super C, yeah. So this is so like... This, this, uh, I don't know uh, the E flat, I think with eight lines or nine lines or something like that. My God. That, that E flat, I mean. Mm -hmm. So when I asked you, ask you to play that E flat, you will not be very happy. I will run screaming. <laughs> yeah. And and when I ask you, please, not only you have to play that E flat, but you have to play it also pianissimo. I think you want to kill me. <laughs> eh? Okay. Now the bass clarinet. We can do anything. I can play that E flat and even a lot higher, but I can play that E flat fortissimo, but I also can play it pianissimo. And in the lower register, I can play the low C, fortissimo, but I can play it so soft that you only feel nearly the, the, the fibra vibrations. So, not one instrument can do that. Not the contrabassoon, who is playing the low notes, they never can play pianissimo so soft in the low register as we can. Mm -hmm. And the normal clarinet never can play so soft in the high register as we can. So the bass clarinet can do, in fact, I must be honest, everything. We have everything. practice, we can, but we can do anything. Anything what you want, we can do it. All the multiphonics, multiphonics on the bass clarinet. I'm sorry, I always say to the clarinet player, I'm so sorry for you, but everything what sounds good on a clarinet sounds a lot better on the bass clarinet. And especially those special effects like the, the multiphonics. We have multiphonics, they can sound very ugly, but we have also multiphonics. They are so beautiful, so beautiful. They will listen to the multiphonics on the clarinet. When they succeed, they are not always very um, mm, lovely, no? Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think... And, I think you referred yes, to the bass clarinet once as the emperor of the instruments. Is that true? That I, I said that, yes. That's yeah. completely true. Completely true. But the joke is, and that is, I have to explain a little bit. My wife is organist. Oh. And, and she said, Sylvia said to, to me once, uh, Mozart said that the organ is the king of instruments. And I, my answer was immediately, yes, because he didn't know the bass clarinet. That's the emperor. <laughs> and from that moment, from that moment on, we are speaking about the emperor. Also, my students, they are speaking the emperor of instrument. That's fantastic. <laughs> so let's go back to when you were a student for a second. I mean, really early. Um, back to that day when your parents bought you that saxophone. Y yeah. Your mom said she went out for the afternoon and left you at home with this saxophone. And when they came home, you were playing. What, what were those few hours like? I, I, fantastic. Oh, I love, oh, I feel, still I get the feeling. I opened the case and I saw the saxophone. I knew a little bit about the mouse piece and the reed, not from the saxophone, because I had a, a, a young uh, a friend who played the clarinet in a harmony band. Uh, so I knew and I was trying this and, and uh, you don't need to be very intelligent to know uh, when you see the piano also you go up, etc. So I saw the keys and I think, okay, I have to close the keys and I did it in my mouth and I start blowing, of course, completely wrong. So no tonguing uh, right, but I was blowing and it came a note. So I, okay, hey, that's lovely. And then I close the key. Hey, that's a lower note. That is ah. So that when I close the key, that's okay. So and that was going on. And then after three, four hours, I played. Oh yeah, I never forget that. And, and a tune very popular in that uh, period. It, it was called Tequila. Oh yes. And, uh, yeah, you can. You know it probably. Yes, yes. Only three notes or four notes, so I did not play a saxophone concerto, eh? but I yeah. played that. So they came uh, at home, my uh, father and mother, and I said, okay, sit down. And they sit down and I played do 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 <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and the next day I went to the shop where they bought the saxophone and I said, um, I want to have uh, somebody who uh, 
uh, give me lessons. And he, the man said, yeah, but I can do it. And then after a year, he said, no, you, you have to find another guy because I cannot uh, learn you, uh, teach you anymore. Uh, and then uh, I said to my father, okay, I want to do something. I want to be a professional musician. And then, uh, okay, then the whole story starts at the concert or So then that takes us, you know, to the, we've covered some great stuff there, actually. That's really interesting stories. Um, but you were also a fantastic teacher and really passionate about teaching. And, and you've now taught many students over the years, many, many students. Um, what is the most important thing that you want students to take away from the lessons with you? Uh, what I, for me, when they love the music and the instrument, that is something uh, essential. That is the most important thing. So uh, I also wanted and I did not go to the lessons uh, with the feeling, now I want to make my students happy. No, I want they, I'm doing what I'm doing and I want that they go home with a feeling from, ah, I'm doing something lovely, something fantastic. I'm playing bass line, and, wow. So this to fall in love with the instrument. Yeah, yeah, and uh, most I, I must I must say that a lot of crazy people walking around in this world now playing bass tenet, they or are or students of mine, former students, or students of students of mine. Yeah, many of them are probably most of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And that 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 gives a very very good feeling. So then I hear something, and I some, sometimes I hear a guy, and I said, "Wow, man, you are playing the piece easier than <laughs> when I played the piece uh, 50 years ago." <laughs> no, but that is strange. That is that is something. What I always it, it's so strange for me that uh, it is like with Olympic games. It is uh, the the hundred meter for the men. Uh, under the ten, sen uh, the 10 seconds was impossible in my time. And now it is 9.3. Yeah. And if we it will be once 8.9 or something. It is, and it is also with those young guys they are playing. I heard uh, um, uh, a young guy during um, the clarinet fest in Madrid. And he played uh, Hugo Queiroz from uh, uh, Portugal. And he played uh, um, uh, Time and Motion Study. <laughs> okay, he played Time and Moses. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I actually just saw Laurie Friedman play that in Calgary here a couple weeks ago. Yeah, Laurie is a, a former student of mine. Yes, she is. Yeah. So that's a lot about, you know, when you were a student and, and, and your students now. But of course, you've also completely pioneered the repertoire for bass clarinet. I, I wrote here, which your bio says 500 pieces, but you corrected oh, me, no, I no, think, no, no. and said no. 650. 650, yes. <laughs> 650 pieces yeah, you've, yeah. You have been written for you specifically, is that? Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. That's, so that's like that's incredible. And you've worked with some amazing composers, including Brian Fernie Howe, uh, uh, Luciano Berrio, Morton Feldman, Iana Sinakis, and many others. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like bringing pieces to life with these amazing compos com composers and their, and their incredible uh, insight and compositional minds? Yeah, it's, that is a fantastic feeling. That's the only thing I can say. That, and it is not only those guys, eh, like, but also a man I, uh, like Lee Sang Jung. Uh, they, they wrote masterpieces for the bass clarinet, and then getting the piece and and the opening the, the the piece and looking at the notes. And I got, of course, after a while, uh, routine enough and opening the piece, and you say, "Wow, mm -hmm. my." That is a piece. That is something fantastic. And yeah, that is fun. That is, that is great. Is there a particular memory from working with any of them that comes to mind? Oh man, how many times do we have? <laughs> no, no, that is always. For example, Lee Sang Jung is, in my opinion, he wrote um, the monologue for Bass Planet. I think that is one of the masterpieces. And um, a masterpiece is. Uh, also because he is not using one special effect. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I say to composers, and I also wrote it in my, my book, that I am afraid to, to include, for example, this or this or this, because sometimes I cut pieces and I thought, yeah, but listen, 
a piece is not a better piece because there are included 600 multiphonics and 1500 um, uh, slap tones, etc. No, 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 that is a misunderstanding. Of course you can use multiphonics and a lot of multiphonics and a lot of... But it is not like this that when you use it, the piece is a better piece. And that's why the piece of Isang Jung is so incredible, beautiful, and there is not even a flutter tone in the piece. Mm -hmm. And that story is interesting because he, I wanted a piece, and I'm quite direct, so I go to the composer or I write them. And I met him in a festival, I said, Mr. Jung, I want a piece for bass kind. Oh, it's interesting, interesting. And then he asked, start asking, yes, but, but bass line, bass line, can you play a staccato? Ah, oh, listen, listen. So I took my bass line and ta -ta 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 -ta. oh, well, beautiful. So a year later, I saw him in another uh, festival. And Mr. Jung, uh, my, my piece, yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you play long slurs? Okay, to my hotel room, I played long slurs. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And it took six years. And then suddenly I got a phone call, I never forget it, on a Sunday morning, 9.30. And he said, Harry, this is Isang, your piece is ready. I said, no, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wow. And then I played, I played the World First performance two weeks later in Australia. I was practicing in the airplane. <laughs> wow. Yeah, 30 hours looking at the notes, looking, remembering the notes, what, what, what. practicing in Melbourne for hours in my hotel. I said to the, the hotel people, please, I have to practice. Uh, so that is with, uh, the, uh, um, something what I had with the composer, but also with the Yuasa, I told you, the piece with the clarinet with the high E flat, I met him in Japan and I said, listen, I saw that your piece and I listened to the piece, but the piece is much better for the bass clarinet. And he said, no, see, yeah, it's much better <laughs> because, because you want to have this pianissimo and you cannot do it. No, no, on the clarinet, it's, yeah, but I can do it. No, yes, okay. I said, uh, he said, can I hear it? Of course you can hear it because I, I prepared it and then uh, a former student of mine from Japan was there also, and I played the piece for him, and he did not say anything. But believe me, he did not say anything. So he went home with the students, because the student brought him to, the, to, to his house, and she came back, and I, saw, I said to Ikoko, but he didn't like it, eh? And she said, no, 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 that is it, no, no. He was so impressed, he could not find words to speak with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it is true, on bass clarinet, the piece is gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And on clarinet, it is suffering, it is, it is, it is uh, also working, but the multiphonics are more ugly, the higher notes are really... Shrill, shrill the word. Yes. Oh, oh. Very pointy. Oh. So do you oh. think, like, a lot of people regard you then as a pioneer of the bass clarinet, but do you think that you sort of brought uh, the attention of composers to the instrument then as itself? Like, had you not found I, it, someone else would have brought them out anyways? It's so gorgeous. Now, listen, listen. The, first of all, you I have to say that, was Josef Horak. He is from Czech, was from Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. But he did not go on in the way I went on so yes. he so he went on and with uh, playing uh, sonatas from uh, 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 martinou etc mm -hmm. and that was not my idea so i went on with the bass clarinet developing the instrument like it is now uh, also the changes in the instrument a lot of the changes are because i went to the factory buffet crampon and i said listen I have to play this, and it is not possible with this this kind of uh, the keys. So, for example, when the, my first bass clarinet, when I played a low C, I had to use three fingers. So the two little fingers of my left and right hand and my thumb. Otherwise, I could not play one low C. Yeah. So I said, I never can play a fast phrase when I have to use my three fingers because after the C, and I cannot play another note anymore. So now you can play the C with only the thumb and the C sharp only the thumb. 
So that is all, that is happening after speaking with the factory. Yes. How many years have you been in collaboration with Buffet like that? Oof. Oh, yo. Uh, Sounds like many. Ah, many, 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 many years. I, I started when my first base cleaner uh, was a very old model because I don't have a lot of money uh, and uh, Leblanc and did not work very well. But it is not so bad to start with an instrument which not, is not working very well because then the second instrument is immediately working a lot and a lot better. So the Leblanc was not the best one. And then I had a Selmer, which was okay, it was really okay. And then I went to the, the buffet. And from that moment on, I played always uh, buffet. Uh, I, years, years, years. But still, eh, now I'm, I'm, let's say, a pensioner. But still, when I was in a factory, I always could say, could say please, uh, that, that F sharp key is a little bit strange. Can we do something? Or uh, overblowing notes are in that register blah, and they always are working with the instrument. That's really impressive. So what, what's left to improve then? What, what is something else that you would still change with the instrument? Or is it perfect? Uh, no, no, the first instrument was not perfect. Now, now, I nearly can say it is perfect, yes. The, the, the last models are whew, even much better than the models I had before. Wow, so it's, it's kind of an intertwined relationship. You, you've you brought more out of the instrument, it's it's allowed you to improve but it. Not like... only me, there are also uh, classical players uh, the, from the orchestra who were saying, yeah, but this and this and this. They're so uh, I changed a lot for uh, the, 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 yeah, for the music I am playing, yes. Yes, absolutely. So when it comes to contemporary pieces, and we sort of touched on this a minute ago, but um, this is a listener question actually. What what do you find sets apart the really great pieces from the mediocre ones? Like what is it that just puts it over the edge? Yeah, but it, you know that is completely personal. Uh, this uh, uh, I have happy had pieces. I said this is a masterpiece. And I never got one good review from the piece. It is, it is, that is very difficult. It is very, uh, yeah, what do you feel? What do you feel? Uh, I have pieces, and I really think they are masterpieces, like uh, the Claudio Ambrosini, that uh, Capriccio uh, for bass playing it. Mm -hmm. And there are people, they say, but what are you doing with the instrument? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Now that is, uh, I, for me, I have an, I open a piece and I see this is for sure a piece which I play more than one time. You can tell that from when you first look at it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. How do you know? You just get a sense? Yeah, that, I don't know. I, that is because I played so many pieces, so many pieces. I look at pieces and said, yeah, this is a piece I will play more. And sometimes I see and said, okay, that is very usable because there are also pieces which are not very deep, not very, <laughs> mm -hmm. but working very, very well for my normally quite, quite hectic programs because the programs I did, oi, 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 I'm now collecting all my um, uh, uh, recordings because I want to have my recordings and sometimes I listen to programs and I said, wow, that's poor public. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they had a lot to listen to and a lot of difficult things. And I always try then in the middle to have a piece which is a little bit, but contemporary, not Bach, not Bach or Vivaldi, no contemporary, to have a little bit, they can relax a little bit. So, And so some of the pieces are very usable. So I see a look and I said, okay, that's, this I can use. And then the other pieces like the Jung and the Ambrosini, but also the, the Fernie Hout, also, eh, this is incredible difficult, but there is something eh, that is ha happening, nine minutes, something. The, not one people, a person in the audience is not impressed. There is something happening. So the, those pieces, let's say I have 650 pieces and there are some masterpieces, not 650, eh? no, 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 no. There are also uh, not very good pieces, yes, yes. 
So I do want to get to your search for your recordings in a second here, but before we move on from the composers, um, I'm specifically interested, I'm not sure exactly why, but in Morton Feldman, what was he like? He's so, he's so enigmatic and sort of... Uh, you know, the first time I met him, um, I was so surprised because it was a very big man, a very low voice, low voice. And ex the contrary, the music he is writing, very soft and delicate music. And this man, big, great. And he said, hello, Harry, how are you? <laughs> yeah. And he wrote that piece and that is, the piece is so breakable, so difficult, eh? Ooh, but in a complete different way. It is not, uh, uh, the fingers are not difficult at all. But the embouchure, oh, you, you, that is very, very complicated because you have to do it soft. You have to no listen to any attack because the percussion players are playing like a wind that is, no, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. It's always a success. It was always a success for, for uh, with the audience. They were nearly sleeping there. The, wow. And what is the title of that piece for the listeners? Uh, for bass line at the percussion. The, the score is a little bit, mm, I told him also, that uh, he wrote it a little bit strange because the, the bass clarinet is playing uh, a lot of bar changes, mm -hmm. which are not a problem at all. But the percussion players are playing only three quarter bars. But the three quarter bars are as big as the, the three eight bars from the bass clarinet. So you cannot, the, 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 the parts are not connected to, to each other. So when I go to the next bar, is in fact in the three quarter bar from the percussion players, but you don't see it. So visual, it is a very bad score. So I'm confused then. So are, is it not meant to be interpreted then? Maybe, well, I guess you you played it and talked to him, so you would know better than me. But but why wouldn't he just make the three eight bar half the size? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I Weird. said to him, it is a little bit complicated. Ha ha ha. And then it was over. And so I played it and I was counting and the percussion players were counting. And then always after, uh, I think it are three sections. And then always after about, I think about 40 bars or 30 bars, we are together. Hmm. So then I made the signal to the percussion players and then we went on. Also, also, it was not very important because they are making not a rhythmical three-quarter bar. It is, it is a kind of color, beautiful color, and I am playing the rhythm. So yeah. it was very, com uh, very um, uh, uh, important, but it was confusing. Yes, it was confusing. So I rewrote my part uh, uh, on a, an, only one paper. And uh, it was soft. Uh, I wrote, uh, rewrote so many pieces. I got so many manuscripts um, that I was so used to it to, to rewrite music. And rewriting music, it is you learn also a lot. It is, uh, immediately you write a phrase and you said, "Oh wow, this is difficult. This I have to look at." Uh... So that piece in particular is much more um, accessible than much of other pieces by Morton Feldman. I mean, some of his were four or six hours long. Oh, um, no, 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 this would be <laughs> impossible for the bass liner. Yeah. With those long, long, soft notes, impossible. The 19 minutes it is, uh, was already, oh, you, you, after 19 minutes, I had something, uh, now I had, I need to have a break because my lips, uh, they are not very happy. Do you think that was the only reason he chose to write this piece in shorter form or? I don't know. I, that is, I really don't know. Uh, okay. He liked it very much. Uh, we have had uh, two days. Uh, we were together in uh, Middelburg, in the south of Nederland, in a, during a festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I played it several times with uh, several percussion players. And I know I like the piece. I like the piece. What about your time with Zanakis? Um, he, he famously not only worked as a musician, but also as an architect yeah. and under the study of Le Corbusier. Um, yeah. Would you share a story about him? Yeah, that, uh, I, with him I worked a lot uh, because he um, uh, uh, wanted to write a piece and that took him uh, 20 years to write a piece. Wow. And 
he started immediately when he started writing the piece and we were speaking together, he said, I never forget that I get a letter from a certain guy called Harry Sparnay and he is asking me to write a piece, piece for bass clarinet and I was laughing so much, I thought, bass clarinet, what a strange guy, no, no, it's impossible, impossible. But 20 years later he wrote a piece. So he did it. Yeah, he did it. After all that time. And <laughs> it is a lovely piece also. It is a different piece. It is a different piece uh, than the other Xenakis pieces. For example, there are two little cadences and they are nearly tonal. Nearly tonal. Nearly tonal. And what I love uh, from him, he didn't like vibrato. And in all his pieces nearly was written no vibrato. But that no vibrato was not vibrato what I think is lovely. He didn't want that vibrato from those singers, which is sometimes a half tone or something. So wide, not, yeah. He did not want it. So I said to him, listen, Giannis, this cadence is so lovely. I want to have a little. Of course you can do that. Okay, okay, clear. So we did. And we, I played that piece quite often. Yes, yes. Also with other ensembles. Yes, lovely piece. So this is what the students have to study, not to play. When they don't like it, it is the same what my, my teacher did with Weber, with me. I'm doing with those pieces. And so you have to know this exists. And when you don't want to uh, play it, no, it's no problem for me. But you have to, to, uh, to play it, to mm -hmm. practice it. So, of course, working with these composers, it often leads to recordings. And you've been on dozens and dozens. Mm -hmm. Do you have an actual number? I don't know. I don't know. So many? Do you, do you, do you view the recordings um, as a snapshot of a, of a live experience or are they their own entity or what is your sort of thought on making recordings? The, 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 honestly spoken, I didn't like it at all. You don't uh, like recording? No, no, no. Oh, this has nothing, I have nothing to do with making music in my opinion. No. You have to play with a red light and a green light and the red light uh, tells you now you have to play and the green light uh, tells you now you can speak. It is, has nothing to do with, uh, with music, for, in my opinion. I don't like it, no, no. So I was going to ask you to share an interesting studio moment, but... Uh... That, oh, a studio moments, uh, interesting studio moments is when the red, uh, the light became green and it was finished. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> No, I, I, yeah, also now I'm uh, the, the collecting my um, uh, recordings. Uh, and when I was 70, I stopped playing. And, and not because I don't like the music and I don't like my instrument, no. The motivation of practicing every day four or five hours, that, that's over, that's, that's gone. So I think when you don't practice anymore, don't play it, don't play. And I'm not a guy, and I hated that always when I heard those persons who said, uh, yeah, but you can play contemporary music. Nobody hears when you make a mistake. And then I said, yes, but you hear it yourself. Uh, I always said to the people, I hear when I make something, uh, uh, play something wrong. So I don't want that. So I said to myself, 70 is a nice uh, year, a nice uh, age. I have played a lot of pieces, so I stop. There are enough young people, they can go on with the bass clarinet and they will go on because they are as crazy as I am, I was. So I stopped and then I said, I would love to hear some other pieces, old pieces by me that playing. So then I started and that's going very well. I have already about 70 giga. So it is going, it's going well, but now and now is the interesting thing. I also ask people to help me when they find something, but I'm not interested in the recordings, the CDs. No, no. I want the live recordings. And sometimes I hear recordings, I heard, I got a CD. No, no, of course not. <laughs> in that time there was no CD. I got a cassette from New York and I played in the FLIA and it was in 1976. And I listened to the, the cassette and I said to myself, no, Sparnay, that was not bad at all. Not bad at all. <laughs> and sometimes it is that I think, no, no, no. This was not your best day. 
But that's okay, that's okay. But the live recordings are mostly much more interesting than the, the, the studio recordings. I can, I, I can hear it eh, when I play. I, I copied uh, cassettes and then I said, okay, that is, uh, that's a recording. So that's more what you're looking for, is the live versions? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I'm playing with an audience. I want to see, I want to feel the audience and not a green light or a red light. No, no, it has nothing to do with making music, For in my opinion. So Claire Neat's got a lot of listeners now, I think. How, how could we help you with this goal? Like, is there a list of certain concerts you specifically would like, or do you have a, a, a way to sort of keep this keep track of this or what's the what's the method here it, it, you know the, the, the problem is i played so many concerts that i did not of course not have all the programs so sometimes people sending me uh, things i didn't know at all mm -hmm. and sometimes i have programs and i asking the, the organization do you have recordings but at that time they were not as keen to make uh, recordings from all the concerts. So a lot, I never will get all my recordings. That's impossible, that's impossible. But I try to get as most as possible. And I have from a lot of pieces, I have at least one recording that I want, would like to have. So one recording from the pieces I played. So, and if we look back though, you've, you've played so many yeah. pieces. We got, a, <laughs> got our work yeah. cut out for us here. So <laughs> a lot, a lot, yeah. So I guess to listeners, what that means is that if you're at a university or some institution where you know of uh, that Harry has played in the past, have a look through the archive, see if you can find anything. Oh, and let's, please, please, please. Yeah, let, let's see if we can please. send some stuff along. And and what about, like, Harry, uh, if we can get something, is an MP3 okay? Can we just email it to you? Oh, yeah, you can MP3 or a buff or something. Yes, you can do it. Of course, of course. Okay. Well, yeah, let's look into this. I think that's kind of a cool... Cool project. So that's the uh, challenge I put out there to those listening is let's yeah, try and get that, some recordings on to Harry here. Yeah, that would be fair. That would be fantastic. So one yeah. more thing before we kind of do the lightning round and the lightning round is just a quick uh, five questions at the end that are each to be answered in under a minute. But uh, I got an email this morning. You say uh, that you've sort of more or less retired, but I got an email from the Bass Clarinet Festival in, in Belgium saying that you're 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 speaking there. What's that yeah, all about? Ah, oh, oh, yes, I'm speaking there. <laughs> <laughs> so you've retired from performing actively, but you're yeah, still yeah. very much involved. No, no, but but I still listen. I still I get nearly not every day, but every week I get a question from a bass clarinet player. Please, Mr. Sparnay, this piece I'm practicing. I have a problem. Page four. Can you? Of course, I help. And when I have a recording, I send a recording also. No, no, that that is going on. But playing, no, no, because when I want to play the music I want to play and with my instrument, I have to practice, I have to practice and otherwise no, no playing. Mm -hmm. So I don't play. I'm playing now a saxophone with my old friends here and playing a little bit uh, jazz. Uh, I love it. So one thing I actually almost forgot to ask you about, which is absurd. Um, you're like a master of extended techniques for the bass clarinet. What are your thoughts on that? And would you explain kind of some of these techniques that, that uh, people are now using almost, uh, uh, well, what's the word? Everywhere. These techniques are, are very common now. But back at the beginning, you founded a lot of them. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. You know, I heard things on a saxophone and I thought, this is interesting. Like the slap tone. The, the, on the bass clarinet, it is so incredible, beautiful. You can play in tune with a slap tone on the on the clarinet. It is it is it is poor. It is it doesn't sound a lot, but on the bass clarinet, it sounds perfect. And then with the multiphonics, yeah, I had to uh, to to find out myself. Uh, so trying, trying sometimes with especially with the higher notes because I have to explain something. In 1974, Enrique Raschach, he's a Spanish composer, he wrote Chimera for me. Mm -hmm. And I got a score, and it was a handwritten score. And he had erased the acht fa sign in a certain, uh, certain uh, place. And I phoned him and I said, Enrique, listen, that part, you want to have acht fa, an octave uh, higher, no? 
yes, yes, but I made a mistake. That is not possible. I said, no, ho, ho, because I looked at the nose and that must be impressive when we can do this. And he said, but can you do that? I said, no, no, no not now, not now, but perhaps tomorrow. So, <laughs> no, no, that, that, that was a joke because it was not tomorrow. And that's going up to the B flat, but the B flat, not the, 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 the B flat with one, two, three, four, five lines, but the B flat octave higher. Mm -hmm. So high, very high. high. For, that, for, for that time, very, 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 very high. But the idea, I saw the notes and I said, wow. Because the, the, in that part, the music was split and one part of the melody was going up and one part was going down and down and down and up and up and up. And then at the end, we had nearly the low C and that high B flat. And I said, oh, wow, when is that succeed? When this, this is possible, that sounds, uh, will sound very great. So then I was uh, trying, 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 other day trying, really till nearly the blood was in my lips. I could not play anymore, anymore. But I found the fingerings. Yeah, of course you find the fingerings. You can go as high as you want. But, and that's why I was afraid after a while, and when I wrote a book, to include it because when I played that, there came, came composed, they said, wow, is that possible on bass clarinet? And then I sometimes got a piece for bass clarinet, which sounded more like an oversexed E flat clarinet. And that is horrible. So I tell the composers now, and I saw that, that, that I, I'm telling my students, I said, listen, you know how to do this, but when there is a composer, closer than two meters with you, don't say anything. What do don't you mean? Men don't mention it is possible to play so high because some of the composers immediately start using it. So, 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 so when the composer is asking you, is this possible? Please look a little bit difficult. Then you said, no, no, perhaps. <laughs> well, no, perhaps, perhaps. But don't make the mistake I did because I was, yeah, I was young and I wanted to do it. And a composer asked me, do you know circle breathing on the bass clarinet? And I said, stupid, stupid, stupid. I said, of course. <laughs> and he wrote, a piece, he wrote a piece, 23 minutes circle breathing. Oh my God. Believe me, believe me, <laughs> believe me because I tried it. Of course I tried it. But after nine minutes, there are coming black spots at the, at the sides of your your eyes and oh. you are shaking a little bit <laughs> well yeah i mean just because something's possible maybe doesn't mean it should be done right <laughs> and, and at that moment it is really a lot better to take a little bit breath because your 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 brains and your heart will say for a listen man this is a little bit too much <laughs> so for that reason for that reason i always told my students please 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 don't say too much, too much. When they ask you, do you know circle breathing? Well, it's possible, but, but we have to look where and how and when. But don't do what I said. Yes, of course, everything is possible. <laughs> hey, one more thing. Um, God, there's another listener question I almost forgot about. Um, you say that you can't get a great tone on clarinet until you can get a great tone with a mouthpiece and a garden hose. Is, have yeah. you actually tried this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you know, you know the, 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 the problem is, and I think that is uh, something important. You know, you have now uh, wooden bells, you have, I don't know what kind of other things. Uh, and of course, when you want to buy it, buy it. But please don't buy it with the ID now my tone is immediately better. No, 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 no. That is a mistake. That is a mistake. That is a mistake. It helps you, but not making your horrible tone suddenly a beautiful tone. No, no, no. A beautiful tone is coming from your heart. You have to work for it. And I have a very nice example. That is coming a guy from Korea, and he came at the class and he had a crystal mouse piece, he had a special ligature, he had a wooden bell, everything. He had everything, everything. And I thought, hey, a student is starting with, okay, okay, why not, why not? And he's playing and it sounded horrible, horrible. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, listen, listen, 
next week you come back and then uh, you have your normal bell you have your uh, normal mouse piece what was with the, uh, the ding the the instrument you have your normal ligature we start with okay okay and he came and we were working 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 and after four months four five months which is not so bad he said to me he himself it sounds better and i said i it sounds a lot better and i said to him and now you can do what you want and he came back last uh, the week later with the wooden bell, but the other things though. But the wooden bell, he said, I love it. Okay, beautiful. No, no problem at all. So that is the idea. So you can buy it, of course. The, there are a lot of very good players who are playing with the wooden bell. But don't go buy it with the idea, okay, my tone is horrible and now I buy for a lot of money a wooden bell and now my tone is fantastic. No, no, no. That's not true. And that's why I told you, when you cannot make a beautiful tone with a horse, uh, how do you say that the wooden... Uh, the, 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 uh, the hose? Uh, the the hose, then, then forget it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it's, it's funny because you can take the, the greatest player in the world and throw him on a student clarinet and all of a sudden he still sounds great, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for the lightning round, these are all questions to be answered in a minute or less. Um, and the first one is, I know that you've retired, but if I was to walk over to your music stand right now, what would I find? What are you uh, Wait, oh, uh, music, music stand, okay. Uh, softly as the morning sunrise. So, and this is music you said you're playing for your tenor sax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is one book that you'd recommend all clarinetists read? Yeah, what, what I, oh, that is difficult because I have a lot of books with uh, what I love to read, but it is in German and that is for a lot of people not, uh, for Dutch people it is normal, but uh, uh, the, the, the biography from, uh, biography from Isang Jung. Mm. That's very, very, very interesting, very interesting. And that's not available in English though? I don't think so. No. Okay. I don't think so. What is the best piece of advice you ever received and who gave it to you? Oh, the, my, that, that is from my uh, former prof professor. Yes. The, oh, yeah, the, the, he said always to me, follow your dream. How, who was that? Was my, that? My, former, my former teacher, uh, Rue Otto. And he's still from, alive. From, I should try and get in touch with him. No, I don't think Would so. He... I don't. Yes, he is now really getting old. Oh, yes. He's, he said he's 93. Yeah, yeah. But no, no. 90, he was 93 when he came. He was on my, um, when I was 70, when I stopped. And he came to me. It was so lovely. And uh, the show now he's 95. Wow. And he came, to, he came to me. He took my hand and he said, but Harry, why are you stopping? It sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he living now? He is living in Haarlem in the, in uh, in Holland. Okay, so um, what is your all-time favorite piece of music? That's a very hard question, but is there something that stands out? Oh, <laughs> that's difficult. That's difficult. Yeah, I think probably I will uh, the, bring with me uh, the the clarinet quintet by, by Brahms. Oh, interesting. Uh, because that is uh, Kai, uh, the composer. I always said. Uh, that's a pity he and Odubusi that they didn't write for the bass line. That's um, Brahms, yeah, yeah. The, the quintet is gorgeous, but there are also other pieces uh, which I think are gorgeous, classical pieces. I, uh, uh, when you listen to the uh, the beginning of the, the Requiem from Mozart, that is, uh, that is so incredible, or the beginning from the Unfinished Symphony by, by Schubert, that is so incredible, beautiful. That is different, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was expecting something very contemporary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, contemporary, uh, uh, less contemporary, but the masterpiece is, of course, the Sacre du Printemps. That is a masterpiece. Yes. And then you have what I think is very, very exciting is the, there are a lot of pieces by Elliot Carter. Yes. Uh, Gras is a great one for clarinet players looking for something really cool to play. Yeah, but also ensemble pieces. Eh? I played. I played uh, not only uh, when I uh, played uh, still concerts. I did not only play solo or with my trio or yes. with my wife, the duo. But I also played in the Arsco ensemble because I loved it to play in an ensemble. 
And then we did uh, oh, a lot of pieces. If you could meet any musician or composer, past or present, who would it be and why? No, oh, the, 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 those two, Brahms and Debussy. So you just really love their music, eh? The composition. Uh, the, 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 you see, there is a photo that's also in my book that he is leaning on a bass clarinet and he never wrote for the bass clarinet. He wrote for the saxophone, but not for the bass clarinet. And the normal clarinet, of course, but not for the bass clarinet. And that is a pity. It's a pity. It's a, that's a real pity. And Brahms is also. That's a pity. That's a pity. But that is, we have to live with that. That is, does not exist. So... Well, so, Brahms might have come around to it, but he died shortly after writing his clarinet yeah, sonatas. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah. So yeah. Debussy might have been a bit early. Um, what do you think? Uh, you think Debussy would have encountered a bass clarinet suitable at that time? I think so. Yeah? yeah? I think so. But you know, the problem is, in that time, uh, in his uh, surrounding, his, his place, there, were no, there was not a guy who was crazy with the bass clarinet. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, no, but it is true that yeah. um, uh, look at uh, uh, pieces by um, uh, Wagner and Strauss, there must be, and the orchestras he was writing for there, there must be a guy who was playing the bass clarinet quite well, because the parts are not easy, eh? Not yeah. Easy. Yeah, it's interesting. Why didn't the, uh, the interest is, as the bass clarinet as a solo yeah. instrument come sooner, I guess? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, yeah. almost like a missed opportunity, really. Yeah, yeah but okay. So um, people can find your website. Um, yeah. where, they where, always can write me. How can they get in touch if they want to share recordings with you or, or reach out in any way? Oh, yes. You, uh, when you go to the website, it's www.harisparnay.info. There we go. That's the one, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you can write and I get it. I always answer. Always answer your email? Yeah, always. Always answer. So that's www.harrysparney.info, and that's H-A-R-R-Y-S-P-A-R-N-A-A-Y.info. Yeah. And you can yeah. find his email address on there and, and get in touch. Is there any last thing you'd like to share with the Clarinet audience? Uh, I love to, to speak with you, and I hope I get a lot of reactions. And uh, I al always, when, when there are questions, please write me. I have time enough now, and I answer. And uh, and when they find, of course, a recording, please send me. If I get some questions and stuff, would you be willing to come on for a second episode in the future? Of course, of course. Perfect. Of course, no problem. Well, thank no you problem. so much for coming on the show today, okay. Harry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more information, or if you'd like to support the podcast, please see clarinet.com. Here you can subscribe, shop, learn more about this and other episodes, and even discuss episodes with other listeners in the new Clarinet forums. Again, see clarinet.com for details. This episode was brought to you by Dedaria Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daddario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, Daddario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.